ripe. Great aromatics. Sustainable coffee. To protect the environment. It's to taste good. Biodiversity. We want sweetness. Overwhelmingly sweet. It is fresh roasted. Aroma. It's good to the local community. Fairness. It's all in the cup. Acidity is what everybody looks for in a cup of coffee. Quality, cleanness. Um, well, once you taste that cup of coffee, you see the, the hard work of the associates and the whole community. You will, ref uh, will reflect on, on, on that cup of coffee. Good coffee is coffee that has been grown in, in the correct place. In other words, at the right altitude, in the right region so that you can really get a terroir, a, a sense of place. Good coffee, I suppose, is ultimately coffee that can satisfy all the players in the coffee chain, from the people who produce it, um, from the people who trade it, and the people who consume it. We've been working on this, as a country, on this sustainability concept for years lately, and, and uh, I would say that applies to good coffee, I think, mm -hmm. in a way that, that we can uh, leave something for the new generations to leave upon on the same product basically. Uh, but generally good coffee first of all is what people want to pay for. Un buen café es el que se produce con mucha integridad. Trabajado con uh, ciertas costumbres, mm -hmm. con ciertos requerimientos y como antes les decía con mucha pasión. Good coffee is coffee that's prepared carefully and uh, not in mass quantities. Good coffee should be like a good person. You should be a good person in all levels, in all aspects. As son, as father, mother, worker, student, sportman, fisherman, as friend. But in terms of coffee, like product, but the coffee involves social aspects, environmental aspects, involves countries, communities around the coffee. Hay una mejor calidad cuando se recolecta mano a mano, uh, grano a grano con la mano, porque permite una mejor selección del grano y que se recoja en su punto preciso de madurez. Uh, a good coffee has to be pleasurable to drink. Uh, good coffee for me personally is like uh, has to benefit all the chain, especially the farmer. A good cup of coffee uh, has to be related very closely with the quality of life of the people that is involved in the whole process. Good coffee, in my opinion, is sustainable coffee. Coffee that's grown in a way that does protect the environment, that's good to the people, that's good to the local communities, that allows farmers to have a dignified living conditions and, and be able to protect their families and, and kind of progress in their life and, and make progress in their communities. I once asked Ted Lingleton, what's specialty coffee? That question comes up all the time and people always ask it of the association, assuming they know. And Ted's pretty standard answer was, it's a cup of coffee that comes from a unique origin and tastes good. Hay muchas, medidas, el café tiene muchas medidas que se hacen 
porque, mire, desde la siembra, uh -huh. que usted siembra un árbol, ahí empieza a hacer lo que va a hacer. Porque si un árbol se maneja mal, llega tres o cuatro años y no va a servir. Un árbol se siembra, él, él va creciendo, pero hay que fortalecerlo con lo que con el, con el, con el comité nos digan que eso es lo que se debe hacer. De pronto, eh, a uno si se enferma le hace análisis a uno, ¿cierto? Él quiere que a la tierra también hay que hacer análisis de suelo uh -huh. para saber que a uno se le puede aplicar. Ya el árbol, ya cuando ya, se, ya tiene fruto para cogerlo, ya, ya es otra cuestión, ya es mano de obra que, que hay que tenerlo para que el café se coja bien cogido. When we were in Latin America, or when I was in Africa earlier by myself, talking to coffee people, they would always talk about the history of the land on which they were growing coffee, and that was always extremely important to them, and they were always highly conscious of the fact that they were the latest in a chain of people who had been doing something with that land, and often the history of the land itself Uh, determine to a great extent what they were able to do. For example, when we talk to people in Costa Rica about the Green Revolution of the 1970s, they said uniformly that was a disaster. Green Revolution, okay. We changed everything. When I was uh, young, <laughs> my, I took the, my father's farm, yeah. cut all the umbrella they have. All the trees just leave the coffee, and right now, I know and everybody knows it was a mistake to do that. We were told to cut down all the shade trees and just dump fertilizer and pesticides on the plants and maximize production. And they said, and then we began to realize slowly and painfully that this was not the right way to do it at all, that this was horrible. We got low quality, uh, we ruined the soil, uh, we didn't have other crops on our land that we could make use of at all. So they were very conscious of uh, problems in the past due to the Green Revolution and emphasis on coffee as monoculture. So right now we put against the trees in the coffee plantation, yeah. making umbrella, yeah. and we are changing many, many, many things that we Uh, did it with our Green Revolution. gives us this yes <laughs> um and the way we grow coffee that yeah. is under shade is protecting the environment so uh, bad situation bad times good times you know we still live here and it pays for this we get okay. to live in a place so beautiful and and growing up here We enjoy so much being here, being free, always watching the Waimi Indians and the coffee. The coffee season is so exciting, so much work, so much yeah. activity, that the environment was just beautiful. Yeah. And it was a healthy environment. Como primera cosa, y estamos cuidando el medio ambiente, las, las quebradas, el aire, eh, las basuras, mm -hmm. los plásticos, mm -hmm. <laughs> todo here. eso, mucha conciencia logo, our motto, a healthy earth grows great coffee. If the earth is healthy, the soil, our plants will be healthy, give us good food. To protect the environment, to protect watershed, to, to protect the erosion of the soil, and not to pollute, uh, contaminate the, the soil. 
the one thing that we're really proud about is the, uh, the environmental law in coffee. Um, either you have a waste uh, management program in your mill or you're out of business. Basically, shut down your mill by law. They use medicines here, uh, sprays and uh, chemics in the farm that they were so bad that I remember that the frogs disappeared. Uh, and we were uh, wondering why the frogs disappear. You know, because it was so normal to use gramoxone and all these bad th yeah. things for the environment. And then, and then we, oh, you know what, could be that. And then <laughs> we've been changing that. And you know what, the frogs came back. Lo que pasa es que la, 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 la cuestión de que primero eh, era la loca, abonaban con abonos que no sí, eran sí, sí, sí. y no, no sacaban muestras de suelo y ahora ya se sacaban muestras de suelo para poder ah. saber cómo ya abona. Otra, le fumigaba la broca o, sí. la, o la roya con abonos muy, muy peligrosos, ahora ya no, ya eso se va tratando con menos. Eh, vienen de los agroquímicos y eso vienen y todavía uno les, los consulta. Yeah, See, about 99% of the agronomists in this country sell chemicals. Oh, okay, okay. So they take the advice of the agronomists. These ag schools are controlled by chemical corporations. Mm -hmm. That's where they get their money. And so, and so for year, and that's where the science is. There's hardly, I shouldn't say there's hardly any science going on with organic agriculture. There's a lot, but it's all under 10 years old, and we're not going to see results for most of it for another five years. All of these products are, are supposedly only allowed to be used under direct supervision of professionals. And you buy it over the counter, and you do what you want to. It's a real problem. There's tremendous levels of, uh, of, of agrochemicals that are used. Uh, those end up in, um, in sort of the human system sometimes. They end up, certainly end up in the ecosystem. Uh, certain things like endosulfan used to, in, to control certain insect pests in coffee. Uh, can end up in water systems, and that's very detrimental and dangerous uh, uh, towards fish and fish life. Um, there's erosion involved. You can see certain areas in Latin America where shade, shade has been taken out, where coffee's been put in, mainly for increased production. You take the shade out, and if you are able to ply it with enough agrochemicals, you can get incredible yields. There's no doubt about that. Now it's very difficult because in, in the, the 70s and the 80s, Agronomists came and offered, you have to use chemical fertilizer and you right. will increase your yield, you have to right. plant more trees per, per, right. per hectare, right. and, and, and yeah. we did all of that. And, and now we are seeing the, the problem with, with that, yeah. that, that system. So, so I think we are trying to go back to the old practices. Do any insecticide right. or any fungicide, um, is we think orchids and bromeliads and everything else uh, should be here. We are trying to work here ecotourism, right, you know? Right. So if we want the birds to be there, I mean for us and for the visitors, we need to be eco-friendly, you know? Yes. So I mean, it's a must, not just because we love it, it's because it's becoming profitable. So right. yeah. We're always looking for how to do things better. Those that care about uh, conservation, orchids, birds. Right. We, get some, um, we get some university groups here. We get yeah, some of the people in my son guides us for birding tours. A lot of them come here. Okay. And, and those particular groups are usually interested in, in what we're doing. Right. So become, become customers. El, el café está donde está la zona de aves. But to get, but it goes together. Sí, y está dentro de las montañas, de un clima muy agradable. Entonces se, se involucra, uh -huh. exactamente, involucra café, aves, ecoturismo, muchas cosas. Entonces creo que están ligados todos dentro de esto. Además también a uh, Panamá o el café de Panamá, o las zonas cafetaleras de Panamá, es como, como un Napa Valley. Va, <laughs> vas a encontrar... No solamente un café o un café bueno, mm -hmm. vas a encontrar muchos cafés mm -hmm. buenos con mm -hmm. diferentes sabores. 20 or 30 years been a shift towards sustainability as the dominant paradigm that 
informs almost all producers. So um, that doesn't mean everybody's going to be certified organic and fair trade. But for, for much of coffee's history, the emphasis, the primary paradigm was production. Let's, let's make a lot. Um, and maybe let's make it good um, to a lesser extent. But now, uh, if you look at the titles of a lot of books on the coffee industry, uh, the idea that we need to produce coffees that are socially sustainable, ecologically sustainable, is just percolating through um, all of the both academic discourse on coffee, but I think also a lot of the practical discourse. And it turns out to be good business uh, as well. The, there is right now is, is, a, is a lot of demand for organic coffee, and there's not much production, not much offer. Of it. And that's, I, I say that's a failure of the market because the market hasn't been able to promote the organic production. And that's because of the price. The, the, the price of for organic coffee has been set as a premium above the conventional market. But if the conventional market is a dollar or 80 cents a pound, well, they pay maybe 25% more, 40% depends on the origin. But that's, that's not enough. Okay. And a farmer has to take the <laughs> risk of going from conventional to organic. In the, in the, in the short term, that, that would mean a, a, a reduce in the yield per hectare of maybe 50% even can be more than that. Who's gonna pay for that? Organic tends to focus more on um, eliminating agrochemicals and soil health, and the Rainforest Alliance focuses on a holistic perspective of protecting the environment, the soil, the water, the birds, the trees, and the economic health of the farm, helping them with farm management, waste management, recycling, that sort of thing, um, reducing pesticides and, and saving money. And on the social side, making sure that their workers have decent wages, dignified housing, um, access to drinking water, and that their kids are in school. So it's a really comprehensive certification, and a lot of the other certifications really don't focus as much on that comprehensive sustainability as we do. The Restrictions by governments are such that they may not even want to use the label organic because they cannot meet the requirements of obtaining that uh, label without s serious uh, expenses which they can't cover in the process of producing their particular crop. And so uh, here in the United States, clearly we see many, many people who are growing by what most people recognize as organic standards but in fact never put the label organic on their stuff because to do that, the government would come in and stop them immediately because they didn't go through the certification process. Translating that to a developing country and unfortunately the kickbacks and bribes and the various things that might have to be paid to get that certification probably makes it an unattainable goal, I think. At the same time, so finally she's organic and finally improving the quality. And to get her certification every year for three or four hectares is $700. Is that sinful or what? You know how many people she could pay with that $700? No, we don't certify ours because our quote is $3,000 take my farm and put it into an organic system. He said, but it takes about four years to accomplish that. And by the time I accomplish it, the diversity that is on that land basically take care, takes care of all my pest problem. I've created such a great diversity of other things around that farm that it's feeding on all the pests and it takes care of it. He said, but the average farmer can't wait four years. And certainly a commercial farmer is put in the situation that if he's not subsidized in some way during the period of time of converting his land to really an effective organic farm, he'll never make it. We have to go and continue our vision. We think that we're doing the right thing. And if we don't have a, 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 a certification there, whatever, that's why we're doing what my brother says. We're trying then to meet and to know our buyers so they can come here and see and they, we don't present them a piece of paper with a stamp on it. We say, come here, see what we're doing. 
Well, it depends on who you ask, I think. Uh, if you look at the uh, guidelines by Rainforest Alliance, uh, uh, they allow use of pesticides and use of chemical fertilizers. So if you use pesticides to combat diseases or pests um, and use fertilizer to augment your productivity, um, you can still be within that framework of, of at least tending towards sustainability. In this finca it's very difficult. To get 100% of the organic is very difficult. Impossible. Ah, almost impossible. Almost impossible because we have 5,000 millimeters of water a year. Se llueve muchísimo. Sí. Entonces, el uni, por nosotros llegar a ser 100% orgánicos es eh, esta, este problema del ojo de gallo. De ahí pudiéramos ser 100% orgánicos. Pero no podemos hasta, hasta que estamos investigando eh, con otras personas a ver si podemos introducir algún producto orgánico que pueda controlar el ojo de gallo. Sí. Si lo hacemos y hay algo que lo puede controlar biológicamente, podríamos llegar a ser 100% orgánicos. No digo imposible, estamos tratando de hacerlo. We born with coffee, we grow with coffee, and we don't know right now if we are going to die with coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Seems to me like like uh, once you get involved in coffee, it's very difficult to get out of it. It's very difficult. Once you, because in, in this business, you meet so many people. There's so much to learn every day. Uh, uh, every day, when I go and cup coffee, the cups stay different than yesterday. Uh, how you roast, uh, darker or, or, or lighter. How you process the coffee in the milling. So many things to, to learn, so many people to meet. Uh, you never, you never end. It's always a learning process. Hacemos todo. Y también tienen nosotros, que hacer toda la parte de nosotros de, somos capaces de elaboración. De, desde la siembra hasta yeah. que se coja el café. Yeah, they do todo. Yeah, the 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 producer think the, 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 the more money who the coffee make is when we sell it, the people who buy in another country and yeah. sell it. You know, like uh, United States or Europe. The uh, farmer make less money than the rest of the people. Oh, yes. En esa, en esa formación, no sé yo bien, de, a, el, uno sabe que uno coge el café uh -huh. y lo entrega, pero uno no sabe qué sustentación le hacen en, en Europa, en Estados okay. Unidos. Y a, además, dicen que el café es la tinta más firme que hay, no sé. And these people come here, they have the feeling or they think that coffee is gold for the farmers it's Good. like you have tons of money here that you're making tons of money because coffee is so expensive in the states and in europe that these people must be making a lot of money here and they don't know how much we struggle con el café hay hay historias de éxito y hay historias también de mucho sufrimiento y, y mucho trabajo y sí. mucha dedicación sí. entonces uno por ejemplo Esto es un paraíso, es un paraíso, pero fuera de ese paraíso, para mantener ese paraíso, 
hay que sacrificar muchas cosas. They're fantastic coffee harvesters. I think they're the best in the world. They're mm. incredible. But they're very poor. And generally they'll they'll come, they'll harvest here, family of two, three, four, and leave here with three or four hundred dollars in their pocket after three or four months. But they've bought they've spent money while here buying some. And literally they need to live on that the rest of the years. So we're talking about people well below the extreme poverty level. Sí, 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 sí. Sí. Entonces cuando termina aquí, uh -huh. vamos buscando a las cordilleras. Es, um, como te diría, es un grupo grande de personas, muy grande de personas, que viven del café sí. y viven migrando. Entonces, hay veces es difícil dar uh, seguimiento a una familia por las vacunas, por muchas cosas. Y quieren que el, en la finca se controle estrictamente que los niños no vayan a colectar café, que eh, todo esto, ¿verdad? Pero también no se quieren que el cafetalero, el finquero, solucione el problema que Panamá no ha solucionado como gobierno. La parte de salud para los, para los cosecheros de café y la gente que está involucrada en café deben ser más intensas, deben seguir al productor, ok, él va migrando, ok, vamos, vamos a seguir migrando con ah. ellos para poder dar un seguimiento de salud a ellos completo. Entonces, eso es muy ¿Y importante. ¿Y como caficultores qué haríamos? Ah, como caficultores Nuestra creo que porque... nosotros tendríamos que apoyar esa, 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 esa iniciativa. Creo que la justicia social hay que, todavía hay que trabajar mucho en Panamá. So that is $20 a day? $20, approximately, per, per, per day. day. To the dollar. So that is slightly above two dollars per day. The coffee crop is essential. It's their only cash income all year. Yeah. In particular for women, because a lot of the coffee is hard to speak by women. Because right. it's a temporary job. Go ahead. The kids aren't in school. They can take their kids with them. You see Juan Valdez image that is very famous and is very important for our coffee, but then you see that behind that image is a family, you know, work. And behind also Juan Valdez is a woman, you know, that always have been working in the coffee, but they... But the woman is standing behind the burro. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, sometimes behind the burro, because um, what happened is we have these uh, under-recognized of women in agriculture, where women work but because they don't have uh, the title of the land or, do they, or they don't have the membership of the association, so they are not publicly recognized. They are in the, what we call the private scene. They are at the house, they are working in agriculture or in coffee, but they are not going outside, they are not in the market. Women, they, they, they are very active in the farm. And they, and they are very important in the decision-making process. You don't see that because you see men going outside and selling the coffee, but uh, when women are working in the farm, they are, they are a big part of the decision-making. They create a women's association to give them the opportunity to have a membership. Also, they have to own a land, a piece of land, where they grew the coffee. So that gave them the opportunity to be more able to access to the market. And there is a couple of organizations, mixed, like women and men, that women have been more, uh, been more participate in the, in the business because of these uh, uh, struggles of male migration or violence. So women start to take leader in the farm. Yeah. Yeah. More strict than men are. More passionate than yeah. men are. Le metemos corazón. Yo creo que yo creo que soy muy buen ejemplo porque porque. Ah, yeah, yeah. Sí, sí, sí. Lo digo con mucho orgullo porque yo soy madre cabeza de familia. Me sostengo con la finca. Soy más productora de café que de plátano. Ah. Eh, 
Y, y creo que da un muy buen ejemplo uh -huh. en que somos unas berracas uh -huh. y salimos <risa> adelante, pero uh -huh. nada nos detiene. Eso. Yo entré endeudada y aquí voy súper bien. Uh, washing station is a uh, setup, now very simple, not, not that expensive to build, but it's a, a place at which, where they have the equipment to depulp coffee, meaning to remove the, the cherry skin. Washing channels where they put coffee, they float coffee beans in them to, to do some sort of density separation, an initial uh, density separation and then a fermentation process, which usually will take place in, in a cement tank, and then um, a system for drying the coffee, whether it's raised beds, whether it's patios, uh, whether it's uh, mechanical dryers like guardiolas. Uh, so essentially it's a, it's a facility where farmers can bring cherry, coffee in cherry form and transform it into well-preserved um, parchment coffee where quality has been been maintained rather than lost, which is what happens in the absence of a washing station. They tend to say that women are fast in learning and they are really fast with their hands so they can sort coffee very easy. I don't know if good quality coffee leads to a good life, but I can say that in, historically in many cases bad quality coffee has led to a bad life. Um, in Brazil is the classic example of this, where Brazil opted to produce volume rather than quality. And, uh, and it was this drive then to, so you needed a lot of labor to harvest all of this coffee. And, uh, and for Brazilians, for most of the 19th century, that meant slave labor. So slavery endured in Brazil longer than almost anywhere else in the Americas, in large part because of this drive to produce large quantities of low-quality coffee. Definitely. I mean, the conditions of the workers improve, definitely improve, when you apply the rainforest and the Uscape, um regulations. It, they, they, they talk a lot about the, con the living conditions, the housing we provide, yeah. And also uh, safety issues mm -hmm. uh, and the way we manage the, uh, the fertilizers and the way you store it, protection equipment, everything. So it's, it's definitely improving their lives. The, the main reason is uh, to, to help people who is working in the field. I, I, I consider that I, I, uh, I passed the exam in the end of the day when the Growers has better price for his or their job. That seed, which is the bean, has to be the, the, has completely cleaned. All the fruit has to be removed. Very difficult to do correctly without harming that bean in any way whatsoever. Okay, this is where a huge number of mistakes are made. Well, it has to be kept fresh, which is another problem because that green coffee bean starts to age the minute it's been freed from all that fruit. Then it has to be properly roasted, right? Uh, not too darkly so because uh, the darker I go, and this is the prevalent taste in the gourmet world today in the States, 
uh, is to add massive amounts of sauce, dark roast flavor, that completely hides the flavor that's intrinsic to the coffee itself, that came from the earth, that gave it unique aromatics. So all of that's critical. It has to be a lighter roast to really bring out the greatest coffees. Uh, and then it has to be sold very freshly. So all those things, it's a very long line of check marks that have to be put into producing that kind of high quality. Constituencies in the roasting industry, some of whom are, um, you know, who, who consider themselves first and foremost artists and, and the others which, which approach coffee roasting from a very scientific perspective. Uh, in reality, I think it is a mix of both. There's science in the sense that what's happening chemically within the coffee is, is extremely complicated. Uh, you've got sucrose breaking down into, into various simpler sugars. You've got acids that are acid compounds that are changing dynamically over the course of the roast and the Maillard reactions and uh, enzymatic browning and all these things that are influencing the coffee. And, and so as a roaster, you've got to um, invest yourself in understanding heat transfer and understanding the, the dynamics of, of airflow. And so as a roaster, you've, in order to have consistent results of any kind, you've got to be willing to invest in understanding the science uh, and taking a, a measured approach. And the artistry comes in as a taster and to experiment and evaluate your results. Uh, and there's, there's methods you can apply in, in the roasting process to emphasize or de-emphasize different characteristics in the coffee. And, and that's where it's um, essentially the, the artist's interpretation of, of what this coffee um, should be or can be. Um, and in the hands of five different roasters, the same coffee may end up tasting uh, completely different. A lot of really the magic to me of, of roasting and, and the artistry, it comes at the cupping table. It comes when you've executed a number of roasts, maybe with a, a great plan, maybe with no plan, uh, but then the moment of truth when you sit at the table and, and taste all the the results and talk about them and start to understand what the coffee is capable of. But if you're going to have quality, you've got to have people who can certify the quality of a coffee. And you couldn't certify that coffee unless you had very highly trained cuppers, all trained at the same level in the countries of origin. Todos tenemos en la boca 10,000 papillas gustativas. En la parte de atrás de la lengua sentimos el amargo. A los lados de la lengua sentimos el ácido. Y en la punta, aquí en el borde de la lengua, sentimos el dulce. Sobre la punta de la lengua sentimos el salado. Son los cuatro sabores básicos identificados hasta ahora. Pero hablan de un quinto sabor básico que se siente en la mitad de la lengua, que lo descubrió un japonés de apellido Umami. No sorbe duro, es con el fin de estimular todas las papilas gustativas. People are learning both first with wine and now with coffee, learning the, the differences. Their palates are getting very sensitive and they're learning to sense these differences and they, they assign values to tastes. And I go back to Royal Coffee and Bob Fulmer's comment that I really do think in 10 or 15 years, like you get at the supermarket, a Merlot or a Pinot Noir mm -hmm. or a something, you're gonna buy your coffee the same way you're gonna get a Pacamata or a Geisha or a Tipica and then probably screw it all up with cinnamon and ice cream and whatever, but uh, I think that'll become important. Star Starbucks is, a, is an enigma there. Uh, I think they're still doing a great job. They have, they've gotten the especially coffee industry going. They've popularized coffee as a drink. They've made it a social necessity. Uh, the interesting part now is going to be see, see whether they go up or down from, from
from where they are? Uh, specialty coffee stands at a, at a cusp right now, uh, really at a decision point. Uh, wh which way is it going to go? Um, it, will it really continue to develop high quality coffees or is it going to get into these different distractions of uh, different kinds of flavored coffees and poorer qualities that market well, essentially? Um, for high quality specialty coffee to really survive in the coming decades, the price paid for that coffee both the roaster to the farmer and consumer to the roaster has to go up dramatically. It is absolutely not sustainable at current prices. <laughs> I hate to go back again, but it was started by George Howell. George seems to be in the middle of everything. And his concept many years ago was that as a marketing method, he always draws this apex of coffee. And he always felt that the very top, top coffees should be the ones that you present as your, as your opening card, your, your introductory card of a, as a country or a cop, corporation or whatever. So he went down to Brazil and they developed this competition down there. Coincidentally, we were developing a coffee competition that same year in, in Panama. This is mid-90s, mid I guess, later mm -hmm. 90s. Our coffee was selling for for prices per pound, like like a thousand dollar bottle of wine or something. Uh, and in fact, at one time we realized then that our buyers, people who were paying ten, twenty, thirty dollars a pound for a cup of coffee, were probably the same people who were buying hundred dollar bottles of wine. Emma knows that we cannot compete with quantity. The only way to compete here is quality. So that's something that Panama, uh, I mean, we realize that we cannot compete here with quantity. It's quality or nothing. Definitely Juan Valdez is a symbol of the Colombian coffee as a country, as a 100% Colombian coffee. But uh, in terms of the differentiated coffee as origin and in the specialty coffee sector, Colombia needs to go another way. Um, Colombia needs to work in terms of uh, DO, denomination of origin, in terms of appellation of origin, in terms of differentiate coffees from different regions. Before Costa Rica has lost about a, lost about a million bags in 10 yeah. years due to real estate, uh, bad prices and everything. We think that we're seeing the base or the uh, of that trend. We've bottomed out. Uh, Costa Rica will remain as a producer of really high-end coffees in specific niches. That's the only hope that we have as a country to survive. It's on the dream of every coffee producer. What I'd love to do, what everybody would love to do, is be able to deliver my coffee in a bottle to the consumer. Or a can or anything, yeah, but yeah, yeah. to be able to deliver the final product to the consumer, and we just can't. There have been lots of efforts to try and figure out how to do it. The Japanese are doing everything in cans these days. But it's lousy. We're dependent on the roaster to do a good job, then on the grinder to do a good job, and then on the, the brewer to do a good job. Por eso existe una cultura cafetera, porque ha habido ese, ese arraigo, el café ha generado trabajo, ha generado desarrollo, ha generado ingresos para el país, etc. Y la caficultura es algo distinto a los demás cultivos que tiene el país. Eh, el, hemos apoyado la parte artística, la parte cultural y sobre todo el desarrollo humano. At that time, in the last century, um, coffee played a major role in the social and economic development of the country. Eh, el café es una bebida 
cultural que, que a ver, no, nos ayuda a sentarnos. The, uh, you know, the, uh, the stir of thoughts. Coffee is what brings people together in a friendly, non-alcoholic social environment to, uh, to visit and to share ideas. Uh, that's what coffee to me is all about. In the English coffee houses, uh, a person's worth still in the 17th century still depended on birth and the amount of money that person had, etc. But also you could make your way up in society, you could make a very favorable impression just by your wits. And so in, in many ways the art of conversation got a, a whole new start, we might say. Some people say the art of conversation really started to begin with in the English coffee houses. Um, but certainly a new kind of social venue developed. Um, it's, Habermas calls it the part of the bourgeois public space and so forth. But I do think people come in and because it's a little bit of, we cram as many seats in here as possible, yeah. you can't help but be sitting next to somebody and hey, if they're reading something interesting or they're talking with somebody who looks kind of fun, people definitely talk and hopefully become friends. <laughs> yeah, the coffee, Shop culture is really, it is that kind of place to meet, to meet new people. The majority of our customers are college students, um, and the coffee industry has certainly grown in, in years with Starbucks now, and I think that kids in high school are starting to get into coffee, but there's still, um, I, I wouldn't say that our customers are extremely educated uh, when they're coming here as 18 and 19 year olds. We still have a lot of people who just want hot chocolate because they want something warm and sweet. Hardly anything. The coffee, I mean other than the fact that coffee beans are a plant, <laughs> I don't know anything. Well it is, it is changing because they are becoming more knowledgeable all the time and we can't underestimate that. In large part, you know, Starbucks has had a, a part to play. In, you know, sometimes roasters complain about them, but at the same time, they've, they've heightened awareness of specialty coffee to a level that I'm not sure any of the individual, um, you know, artisan roasters in the U.S. could have done. So we, certain, we certainly have, um, have a culture now within the U.S. that understands coffee in a way they didn't before. Um, I think we have to do a better job to uh, heighten awareness of ways in which um, coffee can be purchased that, um, that returns the rewards to the farmer. I think it, there's nothing wrong with us eating food from anywhere, but it carries a moral burden. And I think that societies that are civilized, like I would like mine to be, should take that into account. And the consumers of those products should pay a just price, which means seeing that the people who produce them don't produce them with their backs against the wall. Um, I think that there is a lot of social justice, social entrepreneurship. Um, those are big buzzwords in any university town. Um, so I think that definitely we have people who want to make sure that what they're purchasing is responsible, and not only socially and economically, but also environmentally. Um, so we can kind of talk them through that. And um, with our roaster as well, they do a lot of just partnership um, with different farms. So even our coffees that aren't fair trade, we can talk our customers through the fact okay. that we trust that this is you know, a responsible product. Until you start to be around other people who know significantly more, it, you don't realize it maybe. Because everybody can say, well, this is a good cup of coffee, this is a bad cup of coffee, here are a couple key terms. But until you're around people that that is their life and their passion, <laughs> you don't realize, oh wow, there is a you lot to learn. Most people in America tend to equate good coffee with bold or strong coffee like a Starbucks. And the problem with that, of course, is that it's over roasted and a lot of the subtlety comes out. So part of the thing that, that Starbucks gets, like McDonald's, is the consistency by over roasting the coffee. When you, when you buy a coffee, though, that's been brewed properly and medium roasted, uh, the quality of the coffee immediately comes out through, mm -hmm. the, uh, through the drink. Well, I think um, the, the so-called third wave where it is more on the quality and on um, just coffee bars like Intelligentsia where people aren't coming in with their laptops and sitting for hours anymore. They're coming in and they're getting you know, a, a very specific beverage that they are educated on. Um, I, I think that the industry is definitely going that way. That, that there's this whole 
group of people worldwide that, that obsess about the flavor of wine. And so if you, if you say, hey, coffee is, is just like wine. Um, it's, a, it's a fruit that grows, on a, um, you know, grows in tropical areas. It requires fermentation, all this processing to taste the way it does. Um, you know, people make that connection pretty easily. Because, okay. you know, they say, oh, okay, it's like wine. So you can have the best coffee in the world and you can ruin it fairly easily. So the Esmeralda, though, is a very complex coffee, which I tend to like. I like to have a little bit of complexity with it, a little bit of sweetness. But coffee should almost be drinking, like drinking wine. And when you say that to most people who've had an over-roasted coffee, they really don't understand what you're talking about because to them it all tastes the same. Yeah. It's relationships and see, oh, wow, yeah, these Kenyan coffees really have this, this deep kind of currant or, uh, or blackberry taste. They've got this, this floral thing that's interesting. Um, but maybe I'm somebody that prefers coffees that are um, more caramely and, and have kind of a stone fruit, um, real soft acidity. Something that's got some density, some character to it. Not just a watery kind of, oh, here's an espresso, just the name of it. For a, a carafe of Esmeralda, I think it's $12, which would be considerably more than what you'd pay for. Yes. It's really about two cups of coffee, so you're paying about $6. $6 this here is a good cup of coffee because it's in a mug and it's got some good foam and they wrote my order on a chalkboard. It's all the detail. I think barista culture is sort of a nice thing to touch on. Um, because it's definitely something that I found both, I mean, really heavily on the West Coast and also here in Chicago. Yeah. And I think that there's like a stereotype, definitely, about what a barista is. And it's sort of, you know, a 20-something with tattoos and a cool haircut, just making snide remarks <laughs> behind the bar. But I think, I think that more than that, um, baristas are, are people that, you know, are, can't work a nine to five. So I think, a certain degree of like flexibility is important and a certain degree of like independent creativity but also these are people that really like to work with their hands they're usually really into food um, they're usually into like being able to craft something and I think that's a shared aspect um, at like every store that I've worked at people be able to come in and see what they're doing behind the counter see them building a quality espresso okay. drink as a or you know, pour over and, and single uh, drip coffees now are such a, a big deal in the market. You can't do that when you go into a Starbucks and they just press a button or into a McDonald's when you're going through the drive through You taste all five of them. You really see that the barista is, is actively manipulating the flavor and, and maybe one out of the five taste it and say, that's, I mean, that's just tremendous. It's beautiful, it's delicious. I never knew you could do that with this coffee. It's with training so that every staff at every store will be able to give everybody really in-depth information okay. as to the origin of the coffee and its processing and direct trade standards and okay. all that. Um, but we also have started running seminars and a big part of that is going to be, you know, like the history of the coffee and, and where right. it comes from. Yeah, and so it's a, it's a, it's a huge world that uh, um, thank God we have baristas, you know, thank, thank <laughs> you know. Uh, Traditionally, it's been a colonialist industry. You know, it was built on the backs of, of uh, very impoverished people. Um, the, the first big coffee estates in places like Brazil were, you know, were, were operated with slave labor. Um, and it's historically been an industry where the, the majority of the benefit has accrued, the economic benefit has accrued on the consuming side. Um, it's been relegated to a, a commodity status for, for so long and it's um, the negative side is that as a small producer oftentimes historically you've had no access to to the marketplace there's been layers several layers in between you and the consumer 
and at the, the origin side in the producing countries, it's been the case that the large mills and exporters have, have held all the cards for a very long time. Um, it's been a marketplace that, that was not set up to reward individual producers uh, and small producers who, who couldn't sell their coffee in any, any reasonable way other than to whoever showed up at the farm to, to take it off their hands. That is your commodity coffee, <coughs> right? The, the just regular commodity stuff that's minimum acceptable quality level that goes into your instant coffees and the majority, and that will always be the case. Um, that's going to be uh, mainly driven uh, by either amazingly cheap labor, like what you have in Vietnam right now, or mechanized uh, harvesting and, and agriculture, essentially, as you have in many places in Brazil. The, uh, what's now known as the ICE, the Commodity Exchange, the old NYBOT, uh, the New York Board of Trade, uh, futures contracts, I think it'll continue to play an important role. It's a price discovery mechanism for what large quantities of coffee might go for in the current market. It's, it's price fluctuations are based on partially on a global supply and demand um, and the recent between 99 and 2004 of course it, it crashed to a point at which uh, coffee producing was was across the board a losing proposition for most farmers who hadn't already had um, prearranged contracts with, with specific buyers. You know, it, it's to me not, not a good system when a, a particular farmer, say a guy in, in Nicaragua that has uh, one hectare of coffee, is, is going to have to wait and see what the value of his coffee is uh, based upon this, this global commodity system. Uh, which he or she has no ability to impact or affect or influence in any way. Um, and it, it can seem, it, it's, a, it's a source of very uh, deep despair. A lot of specialty coffee, so-called specialty coffee, is basically commodity price driven by New York contract prices. And uh, that's got to stop. Uh, really the finest specialty coffees are operate completely independently. Their price has nothing to do with what's going on in the commodity market. Uh, that's where it needs to go. But in essence, very few, very few coffees in the world, even very fine ones, have been able to lift off where they are independent of that, that contract price. For some degree of intervention, uh, because the consumers are typically getting uh, very poor quality coffees. And the producers are, are getting very uh, poor prices and, and very low income from their coffees. And, uh, and so both sides, neither side is really benefiting in the current equation. The coffee model for fair trade certified coffee is a co-op model. And that is because, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, a lot of people have seen pictures of beautiful big coffee farms. Those are actually the anomaly. Most coffee worldwide is grown by uh, little moms and pops on tiny, tiny pieces of property. As a farmer in a faraway place on an acre or two acres or three acres growing a very small amount of product, number one, you are totally powerless. If all about you is you selling your product to somebody off of your acre, two acres, three acres, you're going to get what they give you, take it or leave it. And that historically was the legacy oppression of the millions of people as mom and pops that grew coffee. The real hope for small coffee producers is in volume, and the way you get volume is by farming, uh, forming a co-op. We are, we are a co-op. Yeah. That's, that's for me is very important. We are, we are a democratic organization. We are owned by the producers. Well, we are mainly formed by small coffee farmers. Yeah. I think it's 92% of our coffee farmer has less than 10 hectares, oh, and 65% okay. less than 2 hectares. So I mean, we are a small coffee farmer's organization. The co-op buys cherry, the, the fruit, from the farmers. The co-op generally, uh, probably not always, but generally will have what's known as a wet mill. So the co-op is able to process and get the rotting fruit off of the coffee seed inside. That's the primary key quality control. The co-op then 
is able to sell volumes, aggregate volumes coming in from 700, 1,000, 2,000 farmers. Flow, Fair Trade Labeling Organizations International, their standards for small producers are co-op standards. They mandate that the owners of the co-op, the farmers themselves, meet democratically. The, the money has to go back directly to the co-op. The payments are made directly to the co-op. Direct trade. Uh, for, for high quality coffee, it has to be direct trade. A fair trade simply doesn't make any sense. <coughs> it's a restriction in, the, for me, the worst sense of the word. In fact, any fair trade coffee I've had have, has always been the least expensive coffee I've ever bought, to where it's been embarrassing how little I've paid the farmer. I mean, high quality coffee, that's the lowest price, fair trade. So why anybody who really wants quality would consider that as some kind of major alternative, I don't know. We're, we're seeing to it, direct trade is really making sure that the farmer gets a substantial portion of the price paid. It allows then the, the roaster to continue to go back to origin, have regular face-to-face -face meetings each year, either when the roaster um, goes to SCAA and maybe the farmer comes from origin and meets there at that our annual coffee convention or as roasters are prone to do go back each year to meet with farmers to engage with them almost in a partnership where the coffee farm is both of their business and uh, the quality of the coffee that they're creating at that farm level is something that they work on together. The direct trade that they've worked out um, it all depends very much on us having very close contact with the farmers and having their product be what determines the price. Yeah. Um, not a, like a, a fair trade free market value, but rather that the higher the quality of the coffee they produce is, the higher we're going to pay them. And it's always above fair trade prices, which in my opinion is something of like an arbitrary standard that was just put in place. And it definitely has benefits, but I feel like Direct trade can, can definitely be much more nuanced for each particular farm. There's a certain amount of self-hoodwinking going on if you think that uh, enabling a few farmers to get uh, ten times what everybody else is getting because they, they can connect their wine, their wine, their coffee to a particular place is going to have a, a, an industry-wide effect on ordinary farmers that's only ever going to be a very, very slight percentage of the whole thing. And some part of me, I don't know, the bullshit detector, whatever, is just saying, oh, come on, people. You know, this may be a good thing for some people, and let it be a good thing. Let them be happy and prosper. But don't think that you're going to change the world this way. With fair trade, uh, fair trade is really like a labor union movement, which is very powerful when it comes to the big guys. To me, fair trade is all about the large companies, the commercial companies, uh, who deal with thousands upon thousands of workers and so on, uh, and how they are treated. I like the fair trade model, but in a broader sense, the best model, whether it's fair trade certified, direct trade, or any other model, is a model where the price that the consumer pays goes through a very narrow value chain where the necessary number of people that need to touch the product are there, starting at origin the growers, some way for the growers to contact market, some way for it to be exported, some way for it to receive in a country where it's used as an import, and some way for the importers to market it to manufacturers. That's six or seven or eight players in there. There used to be frequently 14 to 20 players who were all sucking up margin in the middle there, and as a result, there was almost nothing left for the people that grew the product. And the impact that's needed at origin on the part of producers is needed by millions and millions of people. Not this guy here on this farm and this gal with a couple of kids over here. It's millions of those guys and millions of those gals with kids. And the only way to touch millions of them with a formula that de delivers units of impact times volume is with volume demand and volume channels. We have been able to certify our coffee, which is very important. Certified organic. Certified uh, with fair trade certification, ah. fair trade certification. With fair trade means for us a minimum price. It, it, it's a lot of requirements from the from the from the members of co-op, from the co-op, that we have to meet to 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 have the certification of fair trade. But also means that we have a minimum price for a coffee.
Right. No, so... And we also, we also have the Certificate of Rainforest Alliance. Uh, it's, 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 yeah. right. mm -hmm. They're selling is an intangible value. They're selling a greenness or a social justice or a fairness, something that has nothing to do with the product that's being bought and sold, something that cannot be measured in the product. The total intangible. And so the first thing you do is you throw out quality. I'm not even sure why these products are terribly related to the Specialty Coffee Association. So it has nothing to do with quality. They're, they have these highly valuable and tangible things. And they're, they're good. People see them as good, bird friendly. But it's a, it's a different ball game. And I don't know how you measure bird friendly, how, how you put a value on bird friendly. Uh, certainly not organic. Ah, fair. Creo Fair Trade no nos ayuda en nada a nosotros. <risa> Las certificaciones cuando vienen, vienen a Panamá, ellos vienen y ven todo esto y dicen, ok, tenemos que cobrarte tanto por certificar tu finca. Tenemos que pagar 5 mil dólares por una certificación Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance, cualquier certificación. Supposedly the, the certification was designed as a, an instrument to help uh, the livelihood of the farmer, not the retailer. Um, yet that's where most of the profits are accumulating, or the, the additional premiums that are captured as a result of the certifications. They, they're captured more often than not on the retailing side. Yet it's oftentimes still the farmer who, who actually bears the cost of the certification. So it's my opinion that, yeah, it's, if, if, cons if the certification is desired, it's the costs of it should be borne on the consuming side. The farmers should not have to pay to become certified. I think that, that if people, American consumers, are willing to pay for quality, I, I think that's the case. So there are regions where um, they take the time to grow the beans right, to process them right, um, to, uh, but they have to be compensated for it, obviously. And so I think it's everybody's interest, both the American coffee drinker or the European coffee drinker and the farmer, to direct more of the proceeds of that cup of coffee toward the farmer. If you really look at it, 90, not about 90% of all the, uh, the cost that goes into a cup of Starbucks or, or Intelligentsia for here really goes to the, the retailer and the wholesaler, and, and very, very, very little goes to the, uh, to the actual farmer. Ahora, eh, creo que el mayor aporte se puede hacer cuando tú, por un producto que vendes que es especial, recibes una bonificación que esa bonificación puede ser transferida a esas familias. Si el café eh, se paga justamente, justamente, sí, sí, sí. justamente se pueden beneficiar a los demás. A good coffee is one where everybody who's participated in its creation has benefited. There's nothing like a really good cup of coffee. Como primera cosa, y estamos cuidando el medio ambiente. She is receiving uh, what it what deserves for growing this coffee. Coffee that's clean and very free of um, of negative traits like bitterness or sourness. Minimize the use of agrochemical inputs um, and to find new ways to solve problems. And, uh, and this idea of sustainability is really one of the things that underpins all of that. What's being called the third wave of coffee roasters. They'll go to the ends of the earth to find the very best coffee they can find. And the social or the ethical element where the workers are treated well and the community relations are strong. Cultures vary, tastes vary, and I think it's one of the richnesses of coffee to preserve, not to have a consensus of what is best, but of preserve precisely these very different ways of appreciating coffee and drinking coffee. Yo le voy a decir. Yo creo que las matemáticas y el café como que no tienen fin. <risa>